I was very much struck by how the translation of the biblical writings jump-started the development of literacy across the entire world. Illiteracy was the norm. The pastor's home was the first school, yeah. and every morning it would begin with singing. The Christian faith is a singing religion. Probably 80% of scripture memorization today exists only because of what is sung. This is amazing. Here we have a Gutenberg Bible, Bible printed on the press of Johann Gutenberg. Science and religion are opposing forces in the world, but historically that has not been the case. Now the book is available to everyone. From Shakespeare to modern education and medicine and science to, to civilization itself. It is the most influential book in all of history, and hopefully people can walk away with at least a sense of that. around 1900, almost everyone worried about the fact that you could see cities becoming more and more congested. You had uh, uh, horse carriages and they lift an enormous amount of manure. So there were lots of people who were really worried about the fact that by, you know, by extrapolation, by 1920, 1930, uh, all of New York, all of London would be covered by feet and feet of horse manure. How were you gonna solve that? And along came the automobile. The, again, the point here is not to say that a technology that we then innovated 120 years ago is the right one for today. Eventually, that will go you know, the way of the dinosaur. We'll find other ways, but we should not be kidding ourselves and believing that just wishing it wasn't so makes it go away. The way you do this is through technology. My concern is that if you get people adjudicating the, what would you call it, the comparative validity of need, you turn the whole world over to people who say, well, you don't really need that. Well, exactly who are you telling here that they don't get to have what they need? Because you don't mean that for yourself. You're not gonna go live in a damn hut in the middle of, us, of Africa and burn dung. You're not proposing that. You're proposing that these damn poor people in the third world country and maybe in your own country, and there's too many of those blighters anyways, that they should just be bloody well satisfied with the fact that they've got what they have now and they shouldn't. In, in any manner ever dream of having the sort of wealth of opportunities and security that we have in the West. Uh, Dr. Lomberg researches the smartest ways to do good with his think tank, the Copenhagen Consensus. He's worked with hundreds of the world's top economists and seven Nobel laureates to find and promote the most effective solutions to the world's greatest challenges, from disease and hunger to climate and education. For his work, Lomberg was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of the World. He's a visiting fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and a frequent commentator in print and broadcast media for outlets including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Guardian, CNN, Fox, and the BBC. His monthly column is published in many languages by dozens of influential newspapers across all continents. He's also a best-selling author whose books include False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. The Skeptical Environmentalist, Cool It, How to Spend 75 Billion to Make the World a Better Place, The Nobel Laureate's Guide to the Smartest Targets for the World, and Prioritizing Development, a Cost-Benefit Analysis of the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. The the planet is fragile and virginal and continually pillaged. The pillaging forces are the patriarchy, essentially, the social structure. It's a masculine metaphor. The social structure is viewed as a force that's nothing but uh, devouring and negative. And so you have nature, you have culture. Nature's all positive, culture's all negative. Then you have the individual, also part of the story, and the individual is basically characterized as some combination of predator uh, and parasite. And so the reason that's a religious story, as far as I can tell, is this is complicated, but I'd like to be able to lay it out. The basic cognitive and perceptual categories were something like chaos, order, and the process that mediates between them. 
I looked at a lot of mythological work, a lot of religion, religious writing across multiple cultures and tried to look at the correspondence between that and certain neuropsychological models that were being built, including models of hemispheric processing. So our hemispheres are set up in some real sense so that the right hemisphere processes novelty and chaos and possibility and the left hemisphere imposes order. And the fact that the hemispheres have this structure indicates, because they're adapted to the natural world, let's say, indicates that the most fundamental way of perceiving the world is something like a place of possibility and chaos and potential, on the one hand, and a place of habitable order and culture and predictability on the other. So you have those two domains, and then consciousness looks like it's the process that mediates between the two. And and Epstein, now I learned in 1999 that these domains, chaos, order, and the process, were always represented metaphorically or symbolically. It's like an a priori axiom of cognitive uh, uh, function and perception itself. The chaotic domain, potential and so forth, tends to be represented with female symbols, feminine symbols, and the orderly domain tends to be represented with masculine symbols. And so you can see how this plays out in the modern world because you have mother nature, who's virginal and fragile, being raped by the catastrophic patriarchy. And you can see those metaphors lurking underneath, right? There's the positive female, the negative male on the cultural front, and then you have to lay the individual on top of that. And the individual in that story, positive feminine, negative masculine, is also represented negatively. Now, that's a very compelling story because it does cover all the domains of existence. And there is a beautiful and plentiful and positive element of untrammeled nature, let's say, and there is a tyrannical and predatory aspect of culture, and the individual can be a destructive, parasitical and predatory force, but that's only half the story, and that's the problem. And so the point I'm trying to make is that we can't structure our perceptions without using something like an a priori category system and the a priori category system, whatever your a priori category system is your religion, it functions in exactly the same way. And we have a religion now that's focused on nature worship, the derogation of culture and the damnation of the individual. And that's the story that's being told to young people, right? The planet's fragile, culture is nothing but a destroying force and individual effort is to be construed as predatory, say, in the patriarchal sense, and parasitic on, parasitic in relationship to the natural world. If, if we go along with this, and, and if we all have religion, I would tend to say that my religion is data. Uh, you know, the, there's a famous statistician that say if you, uh, without data, you're just another guy with an opinion, right? We have a lot of right, knowledge right. about the world, and the reality is, that much of this is built on you know, stories and metaphors and things that we've heard, and it's probably not very conducive to understanding what the world is actually like. And I totally agree with you that everybody, not really just young people, but especially perhaps young people, are told this is the end of times. You know, this idea of should you really have children? Yeah, should you really yeah. put them into this world, this terrible world? Uh, the world is going to end in you know whatever the number is right now, but you know eight years or twelve years or whatever. The feeling is that this is sort of ends of times, and that's very right. much as you point out a, a sense of we have this beautiful world that we somehow this natural world that we've somehow despoiled and made terrible in so many different ways. And I would argue that certainly if you look back in time, this very clearly is a very modern way of thinking about the world. 